It's been six months since the first presumptive case of COVID-19 in Alberta. How have the past six months been professionally and personally for you? Uh, well, it's been a, a time of, of tremendous learning opportunities and uh, opportunities to grow into the role of Chief MOH, which I was uh, just about one year from the date of when I first started the role, when we first started to be responding to the, the pandemic. So, um, you know, I think as with my colleagues across the country who I speak to regularly, I think we all feel that we're um, eager to, to take on the challenge and serve our populations and, and we're all doing our best to respond to the challenge every day. And, and so again, I am grateful for the team that I work with and grateful to have a, a tremendous amount of support from family and friends to be able to just keep bringing everything I have to the table every day to make a difference. Some parents say they would have decided against in-class, in-person learning for their kids if they would have known that physical distancing uh, wasn't a requirement when students were, were at their desks. And you've said the order uh, over the weekend was made to clear up confusion over that guidance you gave uh, back on August 4th. So I'm wondering, why did it take more than three weeks, uh, especially just before school started? I guess one of the things I would say is that the distancing measures in classrooms and the ability to have class desks uh, at a spacing of less than two meters if two meters wasn't possible, that was actually part of the protocol back in June. And so that's something that distancing hasn't actually changed since June. The distancing has always been the same. In August, what we said is, of course, as you know, that masks were required in places where the distancing couldn't be maintained with the exception of the um, seated classroom environments where students were not moving around, where desks were spaced as far apart as possible and where students weren't facing each other. And uh, at, at the time when we made that announcement, there was just some discussion about what the mechanism was to be able to indicate that that was the requirement, that that was mandatory. We did put it in our guidance, which was uploaded online on August 20th. So that provided all the same details that are in the order. And I think the order came partly because we had some questions around if the school was able to keep distancing at all times, uh, what would that mean? How would they be able to move forward if they if they wanted to use distancing and not use masks? So the order laid some of that out. So again, I, I am truly sorry for parents who didn't understand that that was our direction. Uh, it was not our intention to put, pull something out that was different at the 11th hour. And, and I regret that it took us so long to be able to get that order in place. But unfortunately, um, the, the timing was such that as we move through the policy decisions and discussions about the appropriate instruments to use, it, it just took longer than we had hoped to get that document finalized. Back to schools again. I mean, research in The Lancet shows that respiratory droplets uh, spread COVID through the air uh, when, when people speak or are coughing, and they can linger for, for up to three hours. So why are there neither physical distancing nor masks required in classrooms when students are sitting at desks, sometimes for hours at a time. The interesting thing we're learning about COVID is trying to integrate research like the one that you're referencing, which is lab-based, looking at kind of technical measurements with real-life experiences. And one of the challenging things about COVID is sometimes uh, we don't see those two things coming together in an obvious way. So what we've seen from school openings in other jurisdictions is examples of some schools where they haven't required distancing or they've minimized that requirement for distancing and they haven't seen significant transmission within a classroom setting. I think that there's multiple uh, factors that go into that. Part of it is that younger children don't seem to be as efficient at transmitting the virus or as likely to pick up the virus. Uh, and we're also seeing that if we are able to ensure that our screening measures are in place so students are coming to class while they're feeling ill uh, and that our cohorting uh, measures are in place so that if there is an exposure, it's really only with a, a smaller number of people, that there are multiple layers. So again, the, the masking and the distancing are important measures and we're trying to strike that right balance of protecting people from COVID, but also supporting a really effective learning environment so that we're minimizing the risks of 
missing out on learning as well as the risks of COVID. And there is no one perfect solution to to achieve everything perfectly. It is that balance of all of those things. Now you've spoken about how you think that the value of in-person learning outweighs the risk uh, students face going back to in, in-person classes. Um, but jumping back again six months, the number of cases uh, on March 15th when you closed schools was about 56. Uh, it's about 25 times higher now, the active cases in Alberta. So I'm wondering, why is the risk worth it now, but it wasn't worth it then? What's changed? So two things. First of all, the, the risk of in-person learning, uh, or the risk of missing out on in-person learning versus the risk of covid that's a decision at a population level. But one of the important things about the model is that each individual family also gets to make the right decision for them. So we're not wanting to uh, require anyone to accept a risk that's not acceptable to them and their family. And that's an important part of that, that model that, that we have put in place. The second piece about, you know, why is the risk acceptable now and it wasn't in March there were so many things we didn't know in March. We didn't know if the virus caused severe illness in children. We didn't know about the transmission patterns in children. Uh, we didn't know whether or not school seems to be a major driver of community transmission. And so really it was a precautionary approach in the spring to move towards, uh, again, minimizing all things that, that could contribute to that. But we have a lot more evidence now of the fact that thankfully Children don't seem to experience severe illness, that schools don't seem to be a major driver, and it really is the opposite, in fact, where community transmission is high, that's where schools perhaps see more of a, an impact, and also that um, many places around the world have gone back to school successfully, and we're again trying to adopt those learnings in our model and make sure that we're providing students with that classroom experience that balances, again, all of those risks and gives us the best collective product. I want to touch on um, indoor gatherings and the indoor gathering limits. Um, several recent outbreaks in the province has been, have been linked to in-person gatherings, so I'm wondering, um, and now some classrooms will have, you know, between 30 and 40 students, um, why haven't you reduced those indoor gathering limits, or is there a plan to reduce them? One of the things that we take into account when we think about those indoor gathering limits, the number of people that can be in any one environment, is how many people would we be able to effectively reach out to quickly and trace that group of people if there were an exposure in that setting. And so the, the risk of transmission, if you have um, 10 people in a room 50 or 100, the risk of transmission is really about how well they're keeping those distancing measures. And in many of the transmission events we've seen lately, it's actually been more about social gatherings and gatherings where people are uh, easing up on those distancing measures, they're coming together, they're um, having a good time, and, and that's great. You know, I, I know that it's been hard for people to stay apart from family and friends. But the challenge is as people do that outside of their cohorts and start to relax, whether it's 20 people or whether it's 100 people, it, the, the risk of transmission is about the behavior while they're gathered together. So we haven't necessarily seen, in terms of indoor gatherings, there are a couple of contexts where we have seen transmission. And we are working on, for example, our faith-based gathering guidance to determine if we need to adjust that, because we have seen a few outbreaks in that context. But aside from that, most of the outbreaks have actually been somewhat smaller gatherings. They just haven't been following the direction. Whereas in schools, there is someone in charge of the classroom who's able to monitor and manage and ensure that all of those specific measures are in place, which is different from a social gathering. What would your advice be to teachers who are trying to get, you know, between 30 and 40 children in a classroom to physically distance as much as possible, but they're aren't two meters between their desks. I mean, how do you manage that? How do you how do you guide that in that setting? I'm not a teacher, and it's not my expertise in terms of classroom crowd control. You know, I think teachers always have that challenge, especially at the beginning of the year, of setting the tone with their students. You know, I think back to, to my schooling days, uh, the teachers who were very effective at setting the tone at the beginning of the year about what was expected, really the rest of the year went much more smoothly. And so I, I think teachers have the expertise in classroom management. This adds another layer of complexity, absolutely. 
uh, and I've spoken to my family and friends who are teachers who work in schools, and they are um, looking forward to getting back into the classroom and, and again, using their tools and training to be able to manage their class with this extra layer for sure, but it's those same tools and training that they already have that will stand them in good stead for this additional challenge. Now we moved to stage two about 12 weeks ago. What needs to happen before the province moves to stage three of reopening? Well, because we're moving into school reopening right now, that's one of the most significant shifts that we've undertaken since we opened stage two in June. And so we really need to see how school reopening plays out. Uh, as I've said many times, we do need to monitor and if we do need to make some adjustments to the school model, whether that's targeted in certain areas, uh, whether that's provincially, we need to have some time to be able to monitor and adjust and ensure that we're supporting our schools to reopen effectively before we make any other significant shifts into relaunch. So I don't have a specific timeline. It really is about getting our schools up and running successfully, giving them that time to get into the habits of how we can do this going forward, and then considering if we're still able to keep our transmission levels relatively steady, but haven't seen an accelerated increase, uh, considering what the right time might be for stage three. And I have to ask, I mean, you've been the voice of reason for a lot of Albertans, uh, a, a calm, guiding voice for a lot of people. But do you think that you've lost some of the public's trust recently over confusion over, over the recent Order 33? I've certainly heard uh, reports, you know, people on whether it's social media or uh, others who have um, expressed frustration um, or disappointment about the way that things unfolded. And so whether or not I've, I've lost trust, I guess I can't say. I, I've also heard messages from many Albertans who've indicated that uh, they are supportive and that um, they have appreciated the response to say, you know what, we probably could have done a better job. We could have done a better job in terms of the timing of that release. And, and that I am sorry for that frustration. So I think I can't control how other people react, but what I can do is continually offer uh, my efforts to build bridges. And if there is a lost trust, to do my best to regain that. Um, and, you know, my commitment has always been that I'll provide Albertans with the best information possible and do that in a transparent way, and I continue to commit to that. And, again, if there are Albertans who um, have felt disappointed by the events of the, the recent weeks, I'm, I'm sorry for that, and, and all I can do, again, is commit so that I will continue to follow through with uh, what I have promised to do, and, and that will not change. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. No problem. Thank you.